Hello everyone, welcome to the Rumi Forum. We are honored to have uh, with us this evening uh, John uh, Hope Bryant to discuss love leadership and other issues. Uh, John is a young global leader for the World Economic Forum and Oprah's Angel Network, a Time Magazine 50 Leaders of the Future. Mm. He's an entrepreneur and the founder, chairman and CEO of Operation Hope. He's an advisor to the current US President as well as the last two sitting US Presidents amongst numerous other things. We are very pleased to have John here amongst us as our honored guest to discuss love leadership uh, as well as other issues regarding uh, leadership. Uh, thank you, John. Honored to be here. Uh, would you like to give us a little bit of background to this important venture, love leadership? Well, um, I mean, not really. I think we should maybe have a conversation. I'm, I'm not good at, uh, nothing bores me more than just talking about myself, but I think if it's in the context of where we've been and where we're going as a people, uh, I think we're all global citizens, um, then I become interested. I think that uh, I'm here not because of love leadership uh, or me. I'm mean, here because I'm interested in, in Turkey specifically. I'm interested in uh, more generally the Rumi form and what your vision is for trying to do well and do good in this world. Um, I was uh, inspired when I was in Istanbul and uh, went to some of the rural areas, went to some of the schools, went to a, a school uh, that uh, was what might, one might call privileged and we taught a course in dignity there. Hmm. And then we went to a school, uh, my friend Murat, uh, who's also a young global leader, we went to a school uh, uh, in an area that was not privileged at all. And I was struck at how much dignity, how much internal wealth, I think that wealth comes from the inside out, but riches come from the outside on. Hmm. And um, there, I met a lot of people in Turkey who actually do fit the profile of being rich, no different than here in the West. And I didn't find them all that interesting. But the average person on the street, the, uh, the young children that I met in that supposedly underprivileged school were the wealthiest people I've ever met in the world. Um, so full of life, um, so full of joy. Mm. Um, gave me hope that we can solve our problems and, and anybody who knows the, the story of Turkey, and I know that Rumi Forum is not about Turkey per se, mm. but um, I find it fascinating that Turkey sits um, right in the epicenter of Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, the only country that, uh, that sits on those uh, three borders. I think that uh, God is trying to tell us something, um, that maybe we're all in this together. Um, I was struck by uh, the, the even uh, one of the poems from Rumi from the um, 12th century. Come, come, whoever you are, come and come yet again. Come even if you have broken your vows a thousand times. Wanderer, idolater, worshiper of fire, ours is not a caravan of despair. This is the date of hope. Come, come, yet come again. I, I, my mother uh, inspired me with my own version of this. There's a difference between being broke and being poor. That to be broke is economic, but to be poor is a disabling frame of mind and a depressed condition of your spirit. And we must vow never to be poor again. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I, I see uh, these correlations. And then I like when I went to Tanzania and uh, the uh, Turkish ambassador to Tanzania met us at one of your schools where we first met. Which is where we first met, yes. And I've always said that PhDs are good, but PhDs are even better. So I, I like people who do things. I like people who move an agenda, not just talk you into a coma, but try to help people move uh, their lives forward. And I was inspired by the school I went to in Tanzania and the dignity and the hope that these young children there, who happen to be black African, hmm. but um, 
they were no different in the spirit of the young Turkish men and women I met outside of Istanbul. And that was inspired by the work, by extension, that the Rumi Forum is doing. So I, I really came here. It was not an easy job getting here, given my schedule. I was in New York this morning. I'll be mm -hmm. in Atlanta later tonight. But I thought this was important to do. You got to show up in life. You guys showed up in Tanzania. I showed up in Istanbul. But let, the least I thought I could do would be to show up here in Washington, D.C. to see if we can Thank you. make this world a, a better place. This is a this is an interesting time we're living in right now. Mm -hmm. This is not a recession, it's a reset. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not an economic crisis, it's a crisis of virtues and values. So um, let, the be let the discussion begin. Uh, around that, of course, you've uh, touched on, on numerous topics. I, I want to touch on, on, on some of them. Mm -hmm. But in, under these circumstances of uh, economics, of terrorism, and in a climate of, of fear and difficulty, how do you see people, or how do you envisage people pulling themselves out of hopelessness into into hope, into uh, into love, which is kind of the, the themes that you? I, I'd, I'd follow the I'd follow the the road that's been mapped out by the little Jordanian girls I met in Jordan with Queen Rania. Um, I went there with with my co-founders of Global Dignity Crown, Prince Haakon of Norway and Professor Pekka Himanen of Finland, World Economic mm -hmm. Forum, and we went to Jordan to do Dignity Day, and I was told not to talk about religion. <laughs> and I said to some of the advisors, it wasn't told by Queen Rania, I said, well, isn't that sort of part of the problem? I mean, one of the things you guys do well is to create dialogues. This is a, a dialogue. I said, well, isn't that sort of one of the problems that no one's actually talking to each other and um, oh yeah we don't want any conflict okay I, I thought every good marriage is made of constructive friction no need to comment on that by the way and uh, so I didn't say anything I went to the session and and uh, the cameras were rolling very much like this but bigger <laughs> environment Queen Rania to my left Crown Prince to my left to my right and and, and uh, vice versa and I said the first thing out of my mouth was about a mile from here Jesus Christ was baptized. Now, I'm in Jordan, <laughs> the middle of an Islamic uh, school, and uh, you, could, you could hear a pin drop. And I waited for about 45 seconds, and then I said, but about a mile from where Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, about 100 yards from where Jesus Christ was baptized, we were about a mile from the location. The prophet Muhammad ascended into heaven. So either God has a sense of humor or he's trying to tell us something, that we're all in this together. I went in the classroom and the Islamic young girls who I could not even shake their hand or give them a hug, I'm a big hugger, but because of my respect for their faith, I could not obviously even touch them. I was told they wouldn't talk to me. Um, and uh, yet I talked still. And about 10 minutes into it, the little girl raised her hand. I said, what, do you, what was I trying to say out, outside? She says, you're trying to say that I can be me and allow you to be you. Wow. Then another girl raised her hand. You're trying to say that uh, religion's like a mountain, uh, that God or Allah is at the top of that mountain, but you can take the Islam road or the Christian road or the Judaism road or the Hindu road or the, Mis the, the, the um, uh, Muslim road and so on and so forth, um, Buddhism road, and you're still trying to get to the same place. They were all trying to go to the same place. Now these were 12 year old girls. <laughs> um, and I said, you know, this gives me hope mm -hmm. that we can solve all the problems of the world within an hour. And I could not shut these girls up. And I was told that they wouldn't talk to me by the time Queen Rania come in. I said, look, I can't shut you guys up. But I was told you wouldn't talk to me. What changed? They said, and here's the answer to your question. No one actually believes in us. No one ever asks us our opinion. People are constantly telling us what to believe. Mm. But when we finally believe that you are authentic and you genuinely are interested in what we had to say, we have a lot to say. Mm. And I just, uh, I, I think that that just simply took hope and faith. Um, and I think that courage is nothing more than your, and this is in my book, Love Leadership, courage is nothing more than your faith reaching through your fear, displaying itself as action. Faith reaching through your fear, 
displaying itself as action. No one's ever done anything courageous consciously. They did it intuitively. If they had thought about it, they probably wouldn't have done it because all of your fears and your insecurities and your vanity reside in your conscious mind. And, and so rainbows after storms. Rainbows mm -hmm. only follow storms. You can't grow without legitimate suffering. Nobody changes in times of comfort. They only change in times of discomfort. So it is, in an odd way, to the answer to your question is, this is the only time we're going to have fundamental change. Uh, after the Great Depression, uh, it wasn't all bad news. The modern Federal Reserve was created after the Great Depression. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, that's what the chairwoman Sheila Bear this afternoon, was created after the Great Depression. The modern social safety net in America was created after the Great Depression. You can go on and on and on. And it was after the Great Depression, 20 years uh, after the Great Depression, after World War II, that, that America got its moral certainty in the world with the Marshall Plan when rebuilding countries that had bombed us. Mm -hmm. So who are two great trading partners with America today, Germany and Japan? Who bombed us? Germany and Japan. What are two of the largest economies in the world today? Germany and Japan. Who are our two philosophical partners in the world? Germany and Japan. You can go on and on and on. Uh, it's no accident. Uh, so it was the soft power of America that created an opportunity for the emergence of the economic power of America. Um, de Tocqueville, the great French uh, observer, said that America's greatness does not lie in her brilliance uh, or the fact that she has more innovations than any place else, although some of that's true. The fact is that America's great because of how she heals her faults. I think that the question is the same right now. How do we respond to this crisis? How do we heal our faults? And um, so I think there's two things in the world. There's love and there's fear. And what you don't love, you fear. And the reason this world is all screwed up is that so most of our so-called leaders have been leading mm -hmm. by fear. If you were fearful, you wouldn't have come from Australia. Uh, you never been, you mean, you told me you never actually lived in Turkey, yet you represent this great organization. But you were uh, sort of inspired by the story of Rumi and inspired by the work. And then you got to work building schools and one thing led to another and look at you. Now, if you had really thought about that in a logical way, I'm not sure you would have done it. You felt inspired to do it. I don't know if the founders of Rumi wouldn't have done, would have done this uh, if they weren't inspired to do it. Operation Hope, if you put it through a risk model at a, at a university, someone would have said, don't do it. But we've raised $900 million. We've mm -hmm. served 1.2 million people. Uh, we have 12,500 Hope Corps volunteers. We created federal policy for financial literacy with President Bush has now been codified with Congress and President Obama is continuing it. Um, I'm serving the President of the United States of America. Come on. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I guess I'm just saying that uh, nothing comes with it. Love is work. Nothing's easy. Mm -hmm. Nothing worth anything is easy. Criticism is a cheap sport. <coughs> but love is work. Non-love is laziness. And anti-love is evil. So we've got to figure out what we're for and then began to do something about it. And um, I actually believe this is the most incredible 30 years ahead of us in modern history. It's, mm -hmm. it's either 30 year, the 30 most amazing years in modern history or 100 years set up to pure pain. Th those are the only two choices. And this links in with the Sufi uh, understanding that the problem, it's the solution to the problem is the problem itself because you need that problem to, to exist, to suffer, and to learn from. So yes. that is famous words from a very important Sufi thinker, though not Rumi, yeah. I think th I think building on that, the most amazing thing ever happened in my life, outside of growing up in South Central and Compton to a struggling, to struggling parents who did not have a lot of money but who were very wealthy, who told me she loved me every day of my life, my mother. My dad was an entrepreneur, so I saw him. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But I think outside of growing up in that environment where you don't take anything for granted and you learn to work hard and never give up, it was being homeless. <coughs> uh, now, that wasn't in my bio, but uh, it's the most proud thing. It's the most proud thing, well, other than being reasonably comfortable in my own skin. Uh, which comes from the fact that I was homeless. I think being homeless is the proudest thing, of, uh, uh, and I'll tell anybody anytime. Um, I was homeless for six months of my life of believing too much of my own press, for believing I was better than other people, and whatever goes around comes around. And so I went from living in a beach house in Malibu to living in my Jeep. 
But once you go through all that and once you lose everything, if you can get up again, nothing can stop you. So, but that homelessness, that 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 shame, that indignity, the disrespect, the dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, first they ignore you, then they criticize you, and then you win. I think that uh, that steeled me um, and made me better. It also made me uh, gave me more humility. Uh, I guess it goes back to the de Tocqueville quote of healing your faults. So I think you're right and Rumi is right and Sufi uh, th I think that all of it fits the beautiful thing about truth mm -hmm. you don't have to push it work at work at it you don't have to make it up it just it really is simple I mean we complicate things the world the world is fairly simple and, it's, and, it's, and, and truth tends to be universal by the way these are all the religions in the world I didn't I didn't wear this just for you I wear this every day thank you those are all the religions Islam <laughs> Uh, Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Hinduism. I I'm sure that this is the first time on this stage. This is all these religions have been represented at least somebody on somebody's clothing. But I got this from Quincy Jones, and uh, this just to me shows the universality of uh, of life. And there's a very important common denominator, and that is you know our very existence, and we we need to realize we rely on one another. Yep. And uh, our existence plays a part in the existence of others. Coming back to Africa, you mentioned Africa, and uh, I had the opportunity of uh, listening to you and, and thereafter meeting you. Uh, what stood out for you? We, we met at a school there. It was founded by uh, Turkish entrepreneurs, inspired by uh, Rumi Farms honorary mm. president, which is mm. uh, Fethullah Gülen. Mm. Uh, similar schools around the world. I've had the pleasure of, of being uh, involved in some of them. Mm. Uh, what stood out for you in regards to that school, its students, you had the opportunity to hear them speak. I think what I think. Well, I think two things stood out for me. One is that you guys are crazy. Uh, <laughs> it didn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, we drove uh, two hours outside of uh, uh, the city center in Dar es Salaam uh, in Tanzania. Um, I, I understand that my Turkish brothers are honorary black people, but y'all ain't black. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but most of Africa is black. <laughs> and folks don't just show up building schools in the middle of, 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 uh, of the village. I, so I just thought that right in the middle of, I mean, not nowhere, but geographically nowhere, in the sense there's no geographic preference to where you built this school. I, I didn't see an oil well pumping nearby. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was crazy, and, and, but crazy like Jesus Christ. Crazy like Abraham, you know. Crazy, uh, crazy like uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Crazy uh, like Rumi. Crazy like Martin Luther King Jr. Crazy like Nelson Mandela. Crazy like my mentor Andrew Young. To 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 think outside of the box. To tra crazy like Dr. Dorothy Height. I don't know if you know the story. She's right, right. She just recently passed. She's been promoted, uh, 98 years young, but she was the only black woman to own a building on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, right down the street from the White House. Crazy. I mean, she, but she dreamed big dreams. She advised 12 presidents. Mm -hmm. Who told her that she couldn't do it? I think you've got to be a little crazy to think you can change the world. Mm -hmm. Crazy, and the, uh, the only person who is truly crazy in, the, in, the, in I think, a non-productive way is a person who doesn't think they're crazy. Um, you guys seem to be really comfortable in that school and in that community. I talked to the director. They were living, breathing authenticity. I talked to the ambassador. Um, he genuinely cared about what he was doing. Uh, I talked to the teachers. Uh, then I play in a game. And the manifestation of that was, the second thing that inspired me were the kids. Um, the kids didn't care whether you were Turkish or white or black or orange. They cared that you cared. and. Um, and it was obvious in the way in which the kids comported themselves and talked to me that you weren't talking down to them, you were talking to them, that you were not giving them a hand out but giving them a hand up, uh, that they had so much dignity. I remember one young man, I have him on tape, he couldn't have been more than eight, and he was about maybe that tall and he had to stand up on a chair to speak uh, to, so that everybody was listening to him and I, and I didn't tell him to stand up on the chair, I mean he just did it all on his own and he took the mic from me 
uh, almost gave, my, gave me a hand bur burn. He took the mic so fast. And he talked with passion to the crowd. My point is that he had no self-esteem problem. That kid was, he may not have had any money, but he was rich in spirit. Mm. Um, we, we, we need, with a hundred kids like that in any community in the world, you can change the world. Mm. Uh, that's what stood out for me. But that's the same thing that stood out for me in Jordan when, when I was there. It's the same thing that stood out for me when I was in uh, Clinton, Maryland this morning speaking for young people in, uh, in Clinton, Maryland at a, at a middle school uh, there. Um, it's, it's, I think children are, are our future. I mean, I, what I was really trying to say about Jordan earlier is I walked away saying that kids are, kids are the solution and the, and the adults are the problem. <laughs> that we can't seem to get out of our own way. We got so many hang-ups and so many gripes and we're, we're experts at what we don't like. <laughs> we are experts at what we are against. I think that part of my gift thank you God, is to be slightly oblivious. I mean, I'm intentionally oblivious. I don't take myself seriously. I don't, I don't, I don't believe my compliments. I'm not as good as my compliments. I don't believe my criticisms. I'm not as bad as my criticisms. I'm just me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job is to get up every day and be a better person when I went to bed than when I woke up in the morning, to try to give more than I, get, than, than I got, to try to be, to figure out what I have to give in a world obsessed with the question of what do I get. And, um, that's what they were doing in that school in Tanzania. I mean, I'm literally only here out of respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, this, uh, people pay me to speak, and it has to be convenient. I paid, my, I paid to be here, and it was inconvenient. But this is what you do when things are important. Um, can I get an amen? <laughs> 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 We're gonna have some church in here in a minute. Yes. Uh. And we're very honored again, uh, John, thank you uh, for taking the time and, and going to uh, all this trouble. Uh, no trouble, no you're talking, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be very, here. Very humble, thank you. Uh, in regards to your, your passion, you, you speak with passion, what, what drives you? How did you get to where you are today and how can others get to this level of, of passion, of, of motivation, of altruism? which many people say is lacking because it is about and what you're referring to is what do I get as opposed to what can I give mm. uh, how can altruism be encouraged in in a very uh, egotistical uh, so, material based so, world so three three quick responses one is and this again I, I'll repeat this but I say it's a, it really is a compliment for those who may not seem this to be this may not seem obvious to you I, I, again I say you guys are a little crazy that's the re reason I like you this is a very transactional city Washington DC is a very transactional city um, politics has become very transactional it is the epitome of what's in it for me and it in many cases becomes the no business or uh, if I it, what are you going to tell me or get or uh, what are you going to do to keep me from saying from not saying no uh, versus figuring out what you're for versus being in the public service business uh, it becomes about me which is a pure poli their pure political play if you think about this crisis uh, it really we treated clients like transactions and not as relationships hmm. If you think about the mortgage part of it, um, if we had made every mortgage loan as if it was to our grandmother, you wouldn't have a crisis. Um, for you to have a soft conversation, some would call this a soft conversation, I don't, but you call what, we, what, you, what people call a soft conversation, in a very hard city, a very transactional city, takes courage and takes vision. But this is what wins. Um, the thing that has defined me is my pain. I think the key to life is successfully managing pain. The pain you create for yourself and the pain visited upon you by others. You're guaranteed in life every day death, taxes, and problems and pain. The only question is what are you going to do about it. So life is 10% what life does to you and 90% how you choose to respond to it. Now here's an irony. I've advised, I've advised now, honored to do it, President Obama. 
I've advised uh, on the President's Council on Financial Capabilities. I've advised President Bush, President's Council on Financial Literacy, Vice Chairman. Created the, we, Operation Hope created the executive order making financial literacy U.S. policy for the first time in America's history. For me, that was like our civil rights bill, mm -hmm. the executive order, which is now codified into uh, uh, law with, uh, with the financial modernization bill. Advised President Clinton, honored by President Bush before that, honored by President Reagan before that. But I'm not a politician. I'm not transactional. I don't change what I say based on who I'm talking to. What you get from me, you get on Monday, you get on Tuesday, you get on Wednesday, you get Republicans, whether you're Democrats. Uh, I, I, I hosted two presidents in one week. President Clinton, our first black president, that's gonna get me in trouble. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Uh, uh, and I hosted President Bush. Uh, that was funny, but I don't know, you guys, you guys need to lighten up. Uh, and, and, and I hosted President Bush uh, the same week. And friends of mine didn't say anything about me hosting President Clinton. This gets around to the issue of, I think, I think courage, courageous leadership, mm. or authentic leadership. But I hosted President Bush, and I had a lot of people complain about it. Just call, these people assumed I was a Republican, which I'm not. And I said, well, why are you hosting President Bush in South Central? I said, well, let me think. He's the president? At the moment, he was the president. I said, look, my community's in a crisis. So we lead every negative thing you can imagine. I don't really care whether you're black or white, rich or poor, conservative or liberal, Republican or Democrat. If you want to help me eradicate poverty in my community, you're my friend. And if you don't, you're just wasting my time. So PhDs are good, but PhDs are better. I'm not the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. I'm the get it done party. And poor people don't care what party you are. They want to feed their family, uh, you know, raise their children, uh, put their kids through college. They want to live the American dream. And somebody has to be speaking authentically for them. Mm -hmm. So what I have gently and respectfully reminded everybody that occupies the White House or the Senate seat or the congressional seat is that I'm not, they're not my client, poor people are. And I say it respectfully, I think you've got to talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. And there's not a dumb or unint unintentioned, a, a person with a lack of good intentions, I think, who occupies the White House. I think they wake up in the morning with good intentions. They may do bad things, but I assume they have, be have good intentions. And so I've, I think I've, gone, I've come to this city with a relationship focus, even though it's a transactional town. I've come to this city with a public policy focus, even though it's a, po it's a town that's obsessed with politics. I've come to this city with a long-term view, even though they're obsessed, obsessed with short-term, are you with me? with short-term responses. I have never given up my beliefs or who I am, even though it's unpopular to be who you are and to be authentic. And it works for me. Mm. So that's the irony, is that, is that nobody really wants, I'd, I'd rather you respect me and learn to like me than like me and never respect me. If you get what you want, you may not, got what you, you may not like what you got. That people actually respect the fact that they think they're getting something straight from me. It may not be what you want to hear, but you feel that it's straight. And that authenticity has been one of our, tra one of our, our hallmarks. I think the last thing is, I'd say die empty. The most valuable real estate in the world are graveyards filled with brilliant people who had, a, who had skills, talents, and gifts they never shared with anybody. Die empty. Give the world the best you have. Give it, give it everything you got, which is that whole passion issue that you're talking about. Uh, the Bible would suggest be hot or be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spat you out. Translation, even God doesn't like mediocrity. So come at life with all you got. I try to live my life eight to 10. One to five is mediocrity. Five to seven is, eight, is entertainment. Ladies, that's a guy you date but you don't marry. And eight to 10 is excellence. It's not black excellence or white excellence or Latino excellence or Asian excellence. President Obama's not a black president. He's a great president who happens to be black. Hmm. We've just got to be great leaders. That's why I was talking about it, even the, in the Armenian issue. We've got to deal with these issues. We've got to figure out what's best for all of humanity, for moving, moving the world forward and not just, we can, and I, was, and I enjoyed our conversation that we need to have more of these dialogues, talking about the, the issue of Turkey and Armenia, that we need to not push it under the rug. We need to talk about these things. We can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll end with this. I was at Harvard 
And um, as long as we were talking about individual countries, so one, someone said, shouldn't Iraq have nuclear weapons? And the person from Iraq said, of course we should have nuclear weapons. And then, of course, two other countries said, well, why can't we have nuclear weapons? And well, you, America, you got the, I mean, it became a thing about, well, you got and I got. As soon as somebody said, okay, but well, what if we agree we're all global citizens? We're all one nation. Now, how many nuclear weapons do you want to have? See how easy you got. See how easy that became. The minute you realize we all inhabit this small planet, <laughs> and uh, and and I can take no pleasure in the fact there's a hole in your end of my boat. <laughs> you want none. So, it's it's easy to get into the business of what I'm against. It's easy to get into the business of criticism. It's easy to get into the transactional business. We fall in this business in this these these ruts of fear, to the point of love leadership, the new way to lead in a fear-based world. And I, I was told even that the book wouldn't work. I was told that it was too soft. It's been on the bestseller list for 10 months, for 11 months, sorry, for business leadership. I, I just think you've got to walk your truth. You've got to live your truth. You've, you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. I think it was Dr. King who said, if you don't know what you're willing to live, if you're not willing to know what you're willing to die for, you aren't fit to live. Mm. I want to die empty. What is the left for... Uh Mr. Bryant to do before he uh, passes on? I'd like to bridge the gap between Armenia and Turkey. <laughs> I'd like to bridge the gap between Palestine and Israel. Uh, I'd like to bridge the gap between Afrikaans and Afrikaans. Uh, in, uh, I'd like to bridge the gap between uh, Hutu, Hutu and Tutsis in Rwanda. I'd like, to, I'd like to bridge the gap between the so-called gap between the West and the East. Um, I, I'd like to banish fear. And I'd like to make free enterprise and capitalism finally work for the poor. I think that the next civil rights issue is financial <coughs> literacy. In, in, in 1963, 22 million people did not have a bank account. I'm sorry, 22 million people did not have the right to vote in America. And if you look at what was going on all around the world, even in uh, Turkey, we talked about how, how it's, it was a young democracy, a 20th century democracy, even though it's been around since the, since the, the 10th century. But if you look at what was going on in the 20th century, it was democracy all around the world. It was an emerging democracy in Turkey, emerging democracy in India, emerging democracy in South Africa, emerging democracy in Ireland, Michael Collins, uh, in America with Dr. King and my mentor, Andrew Young. How'd you codify that in the hands of the average person? It was the right to vote. Okay? That's how you empower people, the, the right to vote. That's how the average person felt that idea, the right to vote. You had 22 million people in America in 63 who did not have the right to vote. You have 40 million people today who don't have a bank account in the richest country in the world, the United States of America. To live in an economic era, to not understand, to live in a, free, a system of free enterprise and not to understand the rules of free enterprise, in my opinion, is the definition of slavery. To live in an economic era in the backdrop of a global economic crisis and not to understand what I call the language of money, financial literacy, Mm -hmm. And to not have a bank account is a definition. It, that is slavery. So we have got to find a way to empower people with financial literacy education, to make it a civil rights, civil rights empowerment tool globally. I think it's, as rele I think it's relevant for Turkey. There's, there's not a snowball's chance in heck we're going to create 100 million jobs, which is what's necessary in the Middle East over the next 20 years. There's 100 million jobs it has been calculated and needed in the Middle East in, in the next 10 to 20 years. It's, ri it's ridiculous. It won't happen unless we create a generation of entrepreneurs. We need entrepreneurs in America because, and I guess I'll, we, we can end with this, we can end where we started. America was a, an idea born out of a desire for independence from Britain. Um, from pain, by the way. Pain causes change. Rainbows after storms. My first chapter, Loss Creates Leaders. So in this environment where we're living in an economic era, don't we need to give people the dignity and the tools to compete in an economic society so they can have a hand up and not just a hand out? If the power of the idea created America and created CNN, Ted Turner, created uh, Apple, this iPad, Steve Jobs, 
uh, created Microsoft, Bill Gates, after he was fired from IBM, I don't know if you know the story, fired from IBM for having a big idea, for talking crazy. They said, oh, we're, it's traditional now, we're in the hardware business. We've always been in the hardware business. But Bill Gates said, what well, I'm looking forward, not backwards, I'm not looking at the rearview mirror, I'm looking through the windshield, and I think the future is software, not hardware. You're fired, they said. He went and created Microsoft. Micro soft. I mean, the, 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 even the title of the company makes sense. Micro soft. Now Microsoft can buy the PC version of IBM a hundred times. Operation Hope was my idea. Harvard was somebody named Harvard. Harvard University, I mean. Yale University was somebody named Yale. You can go Rockefeller Foundation, some guy named Rockefeller. The Do National Council of Negro Women, Dr. Dorothy Height. The power of the idea, the byproduct of that was money and power and position in the world. What has happened in the last 10 years? The byproduct has become the product. What, why are you in business, you ask somebody today? I want to make money. Why are you a Wall Street banker? I want to make money. Why are you a pimp, on Wall, a pimp on, in Harlem? I want to make money. Why are you a rap star? I want to make money. Why are you a professional athlete? I want to make money. Why, why are you do anything today? You people you say, we, I want to make money. Why are we in this crisis? Because we made the byproduct the product. It's a crisis of virtues and values. It's become about me and not about we. Rome succeeded when it was about we and it failed when it became about me. So why am I passionate about this conversation? Because we're all in this together. Because what they say in, in South Africa, Ubuntu, I am me because you are you. I want you to be successful. I need for you to be successful. I need for my Turkish brothers to be successful. I need for my Middle Eastern brothers to be successful. I need for women in, 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 in Saudi Arabia and in, in other parts of the world to be free. Uh, I need for Africa to, to, to burst with opportunity and, and for it to increase in GDP and not just with aid. Uh, I need for Latin America to, to find independence again and to be free and find entrepreneurship. I need America to, to have some humility and reinvent itself and get back to the, the idea of business, which is our strength, the magic sauce and emerge again. We all need each other. We're interdependent. And so I actually like the fact that we're in a crisis because only when in pain do we change. And there's a humility that people say, I don't know everything. So let's, not make, a, let's, let, let's make sure that we don't let the crisis go to waste. Um, so that's just a little bit of what I want to do. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to uh, take to the, the audience. Uh, please, you'll be handed a, a mic. Uh, if you could please stand, state your name and uh, your affiliation and uh, then ask your question. We'll take the first question. And assalamu alaikum mm -hmm. to you. My name is Zarina Shakir and I'm producer and host of a television program called Perspectives of Interfaith. And yes, I have the nerve to ask that he be on my show too. <laughs> okay, here in the D.C. Sure. metro area. Sure. Um, I have two questions. One, what, do you, what have you advised these presidents on, um, President Obama, Bush, mm. and Clinton, I mm. guess? Yeah. And the second question is, I hear so much talk from the Tea Party, the Senate, the Congress, the presidents about the middle class, but you're speaking about the poor. Mm. which is the bottom. You can't fall off the ground. Mm. Um, and the poor, they very rarely, if ever, speak about the poor, mm. um, the homeless, somebody who's living in their car mm. under a bridge mm. or something like that. So I applaud you for that and mm. ask you, what does that really mean to you? Well, uh, first of all, a great, great question. I think that what people, people sort of get impressed when they hear that you advise the president. I've got to remind them that you can advise the president. It doesn't mean the president is going to actually listen to what you're advising. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm, I, I think that um, Andrew Young gave me a couple wonderful gifts. One was to learn to laugh at everything, to never take yourself too seriously. You know, take life seriously, never take yourself too seriously. And the more intense the situation, the more you want to inject a little humor. That people just take themselves far. <coughs> too seriously. Uh, number two, um, that you want to talk to people that nobody else can talk to. 
I sort of, I've sort of made that my mission in life, is to try to find a way to talk to people that no one else can talk to about things no one can talk to them about. That's why I love the Jordanian story I, uh, I share, and I love all the other, you think about all these stories, they're just, none of, them's e none of them are easy. Bush in South Central, hello? <laughs> um, and um, I think that if, it, well, you talked about I, I represent the poor. If you're middle class today, you feel poor. So my job was to also to connect the issue of the poor, because I'm a strategist to, to, to the issue of the middle class. Because nobody, one of the reasons with Hurricane Katrina, no one responded to Hurricane Katrina is because Hurricane Katrina represented people who did not represent a tax base or a voter turnout or a lobbyist. So no one, no one returned that phone call. But when something happened in 9-11 in New York, it was instantaneous because those were stakeholders. America's politics are rooted in its economics. It was uh, first and foremost an economic country, and we, our politics were created to respond or protect the economics. So I try to always remember that when I'm responding. So I've attra attached the issue of the poor and the working class to the issue of the middle class as a way of, of sort of bringing us forward. Um, I, uh, under the vein of, of uh, what do I talk about, I've already mentioned one success story we had with the financial literacy uh, legislation, the financial literacy executive order. Um, but that wasn't easy. None of this stuff was easy. It wasn't sexy, by the way. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm an overnight success in 20 years. Uh, the guy who created Kentucky Fried Chicken was doing it for 20 years. Uh, Bill Gates, 20 years. Um, Steve Jobs, 20 years. He was fired from Apple. Can you imagine that, you being fired from your own company? He was fired from Apple, was gone for almost 15 years before he came back and became an overnight success. So none of this is going to be easy. None of it's going to be quick. Love is work. What's my point? I tried for seven years to get George Bush, and he's a nice man. I, 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 I don't just say things that are different to irritate people. I actually just, this is what I believe. I'll say to anybody, he's a nice man. You can disagree about whether he's a good president or not, but he didn't wake up in the morning and said, how do I screw up America? <laughs> I mean, you know, the guy thought he was doing the right thing. He might have been wrong, but he thought he was. And if you don't believe that, you should go live in another country. You know what I'm saying? So what Andrew Young taught me was when I was getting cynical, he said, be skeptical, but don't be cynical. He said, you've got to believe that President Bush is a good man with bad counsel. And you go in there and give that man good counsel. And then, check this out, wait for the political opportunity to make him look good. Now that's a lot to swallow because I didn't agree with a lot of the policies and some other things that were going on, but he was the President of the United States. But, so, to make a long story short, I went back in, had months of meetings, and finally got the executive order signed. Was it worth it? You bet. He reminded me that it wasn't the charismatic John F. Kennedy who signed the civil rights legislation. It was Johnson. And Johnson, if anybody knows his legacy, was not necessarily the nicest person that came to Jews, women, and blacks. He's actually on tape being not so nice. But you never know who your friends are going to be, so make friends everywhere. So my job with Obama is the same thing, is to, is to help him see things that he's maybe too busy, because he's got a lot of things on his plate, to see, to deal with the issues, to talk about things nobody wants to talk about, uh, but to do it in a way that lifts all boats and make him look good. It's not about me. Um, when. Uh, when Martin Luther King Jr. gave that I Have a Dream speech, after it was over, there was a meeting with Johnson, this next administration, in the White House. Martin Luther King Jr. was the only person President Johnson did not allow to speak in a two-hour meeting at the White House. So Andrew Young leaned over to him and said, aren't you furious? And he said, no, I just want the, the right thing to happen. Now you think about today, no one remembers anybody else in that meeting. Just do the right thing for the right reason. Whatever goes around, comes around. Yes, we have a question there, please. Uh, my name is Kami, but I write for the Pakistani Spectator. Yeah. And uh, I'm not asking you the question that is related with your subject, but I'm asking a question that I asked a couple of months ago to Dr. Akbar Ahmed. He is a philosopher and professor at American University. Mm. And in his, in his uh, talk, he said that American once it's come to their relationship with Islam or Muslim, they are going through a kind of identity crisis. And it would take them a couple of years to settle that 
what and how they should treat Muslim or Islam. And I disagreed with him. I told him I've been in this city for almost quarter of a century. Mm. And uh, mostly I live with white. I went to black school. Mm. And I gave him one example. Mm. Uh, I went to UDC. I have two degrees from there, my mm. undergraduate and master's. Mm. And, but I would hang out with white professor or with father professor. And most of those people used to believe that black are intellectually inferior. Mm. They are genetically pro-violent. Mm. These are the things I believed that too mm. when I was there. Mm. But what happened then there was a one million march here in Washington, D.C. Mm. I wanted to go there. I was living with the white family and lady I was living with, Helen S. Thomas, discouraged me to go there. And it was the same thing I was dating with a white, wo dating a white woman and she discouraged me. She told me, you are not dark enough. Mm. And uh, I thought that I don't know. I thought maybe you know there are little prejudices they were trying to stop me. But when I saw Washington DC downtown, whole Washington DC was shut down. Mm. So I was shocked that these people, I used to go, I'm a Muslim, but I used to go to National Presbyterian Church that mm. is very close to AU. Mm. And th in my Bible study group, there was two black guys, everyone else was white and they were, had good relationship. But these were the very people who were discouraging me to go to one million man march. Mm. And I went there anyway, and I was the probably only non-black person there. Mm. And I felt so comfortable, so at home. Mm. And these people were so peaceful. Even Farhan, mm. he talked very good, just uh, maybe like five or six percent of his talk was bad, anti-Semitic. But the rest of that was very good. Mm. So I asked this question to Dr. Akbar, and I'm going to, I did, he didn't give me the answer. Mm. I want to answer from you. And my question is that I, I admire America. I, I would give my life for this country. But then I believe that there is a correlation between being your worldly rich and your insecurity. Being your what? Being worldly rich. If you have more resources, if you have more mm. wealth, mm. you are more insecure. Mm. And that is very much true about this country. Mm. Look, for example, we have a couple of thousand of, uh, 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 I would say, terrorists in <coughs> Afghanistan. We have sent 100,000 American troops to go after those couple of thousand of troublemakers that we conceive troublemaker. Mm. They, are, they are defending their country, right? Mm. So, but how much force we want to use against weak people, it's beyond comprehension. Mm. We are spending billion of dollars to go after those couple of thousand of people. Mm. Isn't that insecurity? Mm. And where is this insecurity coming from? Mm. You know, I, I told you I'm not anti-America. Mm -hmm. I went to Pakistan only twice within the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. And I fight when I go, I fight with my Pakistani brother in the support of uh, American uh, policies or American people. I argue with everyone. But when I'm here, I love to criticize US foreign policy. Mm. And I think this is the reason I love this country. I go to think tank. You could see me sometime or see spanners. Uh, I am very blunt about criticism. No one ever bothered me. Mm. There are so many Pakistani who have been deported, but no one ever bothered me. Mm. So this is the very reason I love this country. Mm. But I want to ask you this critical question. Why do you think Americans are so insecure, especially once it's come to their treatment of, of Muslim? Thanks. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of questions in your question, um, but let me answer the core question. America's insecure because the world's insecure. You know, I, I love my friends who criticize America, America criticize our form of democracy, and criticize our form of capitalism. Uh, I would say, let's assume for the moment that I agree with you, with your criticism. Let's assume that for the moment. I would say that I love, that I, that I think that our form of democracy and our form of capitalism is a horrible system, except for every other system. I would go further and say, if you don't like America, that means you know of something better, you know of a perfect democracy. Tell me where it is. Now, I, I've been to 70 countries. I travel 500,000 miles a year. I've been on every continent this year. I haven't found a perfect democracy. There, there's something called the bum factor. 20% of Republicans are bums. 20% of Democrats are bums. 20% of the middle, uh, people in the Middle East are bums. 20% of people in America are bums. You, you, you're the, there are bums everywhere. I have bums in my family. I've got 20% of my, 
I've got cousins who are bums. <laughs> that doesn't mean I don't love them. I may not like them. I may not loan them money. <laughs> I may not leave them with my cousin. Uh, I may not leave them with my nephew. But it doesn't mean, but, but they're still family. Um, I guess what I'm saying to you is that first of all, all of these borders are false borders. If you go to Ethiopia, you have this argument between Ethiopia and Eritreans. It's the same family. Somebody came along and created a false border and said, this is my country. Well, these two guys who are present in these countries are cousins, <laughs> okay? You want to understand Pakistan? You better go back to, to the partition. And you need to understand the issues with Mahatma Gandhi. And it was personal. And it was, these issues are complicated, but they're really simple. Uh, you want to understand the problem in the Middle East? Uh, you got to go back to Abraham. And you got to go back to the fact that he had two children. One was Islamic, and one was what we call mainstream. The Islamic child got kicked out of the, out of the house in a very indignified way with her mother. They've been upset ever since. It's a family feud. I'm simplifying it, but not really. <laughs> um, we all discriminate. I discriminate. I discriminate against stupid and dumb people all the time, and I'm working on it. Uh, you discriminate. You decided what uh, outfit to wear tonight. You discriminated against another outfit that, t that you didn't wear. You decided what, decided what tie to wear tonight. That you discriminated against the tie. The, by not putting another tie, you discriminated. We all discriminate because we have discriminating tastes, but that's different from being a racist. You follow me? Now, can you discriminate and, and, and hurt people? Sure you can. People do it all the time. It doesn't mean that they were conscious about it. I, this is a much deeper, we should almost do a session just on this because you, this, is, this is where a lot of our problems in the world come from. The, the, reality, the reality is that most racism, things that we call racism, come out of economic insecurity. Think about what happened in Germany. In 1925, Hitler was jailed as a crackpot in Germany. By 1939, he became the first man saluted by a military. What happened? I mean, it was the same country. I mean, what happened is the economy went in the tank, and it had been going in the tank since World War I. So people's insecurities came out. What's happening now? You have a lot of not-so-educated white males who are upset because they can't get a job. And that economic insecurity is driving their other insecurities to the surface, and that's what you're seeing in reaction. I can take what's happening in the Middle East, Osama bin Laden. He's playing on the insecurities of poor people who feel an indignity because they, can't have a, because they don't have a TV set, because they don't have a food for their family, they, don't, they can't take care of their responsibilities, uh, even though they want to work hard and so on and so forth. Dignity is really the issue. That's why I always say, talk without being offensive, listen without being defensive, and always leave even your adversary with their dignity. The other, so when you're an insecure person and you have a lot of toys, you want to play with all of them. There's your war analogy. Doesn't mean that it's right, uh, but I've already said that success in life is about how you manage pain. If you're insecure, you're not going to manage pain very well. I mean, this is a much deeper conversation. I guess what I'm trying to say is we shouldn't be in the blame business. Uh, that we should not, that we should seek forgiveness, we should forgive others because we need forgiveness ourselves. None of us are perfect. We're all a bit screwed up, starting with me. And so I don't think that America's lashing out at our Islamic brothers. I think that America's in pain. And we're looking for a scapegoat so that we don't have to blame ourselves. No different than Germany's, the, the, the guy who was your, your, um, your butcher or he was your banker became that Jew. And, and you, you, you can just see history repeats itself for 2,000 years. So I thank you for your question. I think it's, uh, it's probably uh, another conversation for another time. I hope I answered at least part of it. Uh, but I think that America is a great country trying the best it can to get out of its own way. Um, but we're all, we're all a little screwed up. Um, but rainbows only follow storms. On that note, uh, we've come to the end of our program. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for uh, being with us here at the Rumi Farm. Until next time, uh, have a pleasant evening. And I'd like to thank, of course, John 
uh, for attending this evening for my, his enlightenment talk. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.